All right, thank you so much. And thanks, everyone, for coming. I'm so excited to be here and tell you about what we've been working on. But before I tell you about where we're going, I wanted to give you a little bit of a sense of where we came from. And maybe the name Weights and Biases gives you a clue into that. We were founded to help ML practitioners make ML work in the real world. And we were founded with the observation that software engineers have fantastic tools to make software, but ML engineers are missing those tools. And this is fundamentally because software development and AI development have very different workflows. So software development is a mostly deterministic and linear workflow. I love doing it. AI development is harder. It's an experimental workflow. And so when you develop software, your code is your IP. And companies realize this. They protect and version their code. But when you develop models, your learning is your IP. And you might think, wait, the models are my IP. But you can't actually inspect a model. Despite a mountain of work on explainability, these models are entirely still mostly black boxes. But there's the learning along the way as you develop the model that helps you build better models that's critical to your success. But you know, most companies don't track or save the things that they learn along the way in any kind of organized system, and that means that they're throwing away their most valuable IP. So why don't they do this? It's because tracking is hard. You can never rely on humans to do it consistently, and on top of that, just tracking things like hyperparameters doesn't really track everything you need. You need reproducibility. If you can't reproduce your experiments, you aren't really tracking your experiments. And reproducibility is even harder. It's painful. Many fields other than AI talk about a reproducibility crisis. It creates a ton of overhead. But if you do it right, not only have you tracked everything, but the barriers to collaboration drop. And when you collaborate well, teams are great faster, development goes into production faster, and products actually get better faster. But of course, most people know this. Every team would tell you they want to track what they're doing better. So we thought a lot about how in practice do you make this tracking work? And a kind of obvious observation, easy to observe, hard to do, is you make it super easy to get started one line of code. And then importantly, from that one line integration, you need to show a ton of immediate value. You need to show the end user, the ML engineer, as many useful things as you possibly can. And this is really hard to do. We discovered that in order to pull this off, you have to integrate with everything out there. You have to meet the users where they are and fit into their existing workflows and frameworks. We've invested an enormous amount of work into integrating with every AI tool out there. And we've, we've spent the last five years supporting the AI development workflow, which brings us to where we are today. I really, truly believe that we've built a fantastic set of tools for ML developers. We see this because thousands of teams, thousands of companies, hundreds of thousands of humans inside those companies rely on us for their ML workflows. And at scale, we really become a system of record for everything that ML teams do. This is what our customers say. Salesforce talks about the value of saving everything. OpenAI talks about increasing their sanity as their team size increases. Maybe my favorite quote is Toyota talking about a 10x increase in velocity, which I feel so proud of because we started this company because we believed so much in the transformative power of AI. And we believed that speeding up the development by even 1x of someone would be enormously valuable to the world. So 10x just blows our minds. And besides the customers using our tools, there's really been one other seismic shift in the industry in the past five years. And that's this massive increase 100,000 increase in the size of models that our customers use. 
And from this increase in size comes amazing new applications. When I graduated from school as a young ML engineer, working for Tim here in the front row, <laughs> you kind of had this choice. You could go into search, or you could go work on Wall Street. Now every industry uses ML. We see self-driving cars in the streets in San Francisco. We see AlphaFold and other bio companies like in Citro unlocking completely new ways of making medicine. We see John Deere and others automating agriculture. But even beyond that, maybe the most exciting thing is foundation models like OpenAI, Mistral, Llama, which allow developers to build their own AI applications on top of them, which has created an absolute explosion of use cases. This is true democratization of AI. Software developers can now do things better with foundation model APIs than a whole team building a custom model could do in the past. This is OpenUI that my co-founder, Chris, built. He's here in the front row. You can come get a demo. He built this incredible application just for fun. You should ask him about it. And it's not just building on top of models. Customizing models, a process long called fine tuning, has gotten so much easier and cheaper. Results with LoRa are almost as good as full parameter fine tuning. And these fine tuning strategies can take a model that's much worse than the state of the art and make it actually better than the state of the art on a specific use case. And QLoRa has reduced the parameter size further, and therefore memory consumption comes down by an order of magnitude, which allows giant models to be trained on a single GPU. This was a science project a few months ago. Now there's an explosion of services. Some of the people in this room will do it for you. So where does that leave us? We started Weights and Biases to help ML practitioners work in the real world. And there's now far more ML practitioners than we ever imagined there might be. And they have multiple personas with different needs. We think a lot about individual needs, and we see one big split among our user base. And that's between the people that are building very large models, unimaginably large models to me 10 years ago, and the people that are building even bigger models than that. And we call the people building the biggest models, the small number of users building the massive foundation models, we're just going to call them foundation model builders. And then the rest are building models for specific applications. There's obviously a fair amount of overlap, but these workflows are distinct. And we want to make sure that we're building for everyone on our platform. So I want to highlight what we're doing for each of these groups. Let's start with foundation model builders. Now, one thing that I feel extraordinarily proud of, if you are a foundation model builder, you almost certainly use weights and biases today. I feel incredibly proud that almost all foundation models use weights and biases. These are the companies that we know of that are building foundation models using weights and biases. And of course, inside enterprises, there's also things they call foundation models that they use internally. And for you foundation model builders, we don't take you for granted. Foundation model builders have pushed the boundaries of weights and biases historically. And you guys continue to push performance needs today. For example, when we started weights and biases, we expected to see workspaces with, I don't know, thousands of experiments. We have this great table here where each row is an experiment, each column is a metric. This is what it might look like. Now, we see workspaces with millions of experiments, single projects with millions of runs. Inside those runs, we now see hundreds of thousands of metrics. We might have expected tens or hundreds of metrics. So now that table is not only millions of rows long, it's hundreds of thousands of columns long. In the first version of Weights and Biases, we just loaded that into the browser. That's no longer possible. <laughs> And inside those metrics, we now see millions of data points logged. And on top of that, unfortunately for us, the metrics that people most want to look at are the metrics in the job that's currently running, which means that the latency between writing information and reading information has to be incredibly low. Now, all this is changing at the same time that we have an exponentially increasing user base. So, we realized we needed to change the way we architected our platform while it's running. That's what startups do. 
It's taken us quite a while, but we're really proud to say that we've brought down the latency of the longest running queries spectacularly. There's certainly, <laughs> I know that resonates especially for a lot of you, and I know I need to tell you, we're still working on it. It's not perfect. I'm not claiming it's perfect. This is hard to do. But as we've improved the performance, we've also raised the bar on our expectations of what we want the platform to do. There's one more thing in the weeds, maybe the most common request from foundation model builders, which is that we've moved the aggregation of the metrics from the front end to the back end. This is important because when you train foundation models, even a single loss spike on a million step run can indicate some huge problem that you want to know about. When we started weights and biases, we made the decision to sample in the back end and do the aggregation in the front end for speed from a user perspective. But what happens is you get the graph on the left here, where you don't see all the spikes that might be happening in your long running training. We've now switched the aggregation to the back end, which gives you the graph on the right, which is a much more accurate depiction of what's going on. Another huge scaling improvement is within our data lineage system. It's the same thing with data lineage. When we built out our system, we just didn't imagine the scale of data sets customers would want to track or the number of evaluations that customers would want to do against a single run. This is an interesting project because it required, obviously, a backend change just to load this graph into the browser. But more importantly, it forced us to rethink the visualizations and the UI to make it actually possible to look through millions of things in a directed graph like this. We really feel that we have the best and most scalable data lineage tracking system for ML, and we would love for you to use it. Another thing, it's common to think of a training run as a linear process, checkpointing, resuming, we've all done that for years and years. But foundation model builders do a thing that's more complex and new to me at least, where the checkpointing creates a tree of runs and metrics. And now, foundation model builders need a way to view performance across this tree of runs. So we made forking runs a first class citizen in our data model. It's not uncommon to stop at a point in time and literally change the architecture of your model and continue to run different architectures at the same time. These features felt like science fiction to us a few years ago, but now they're important to our most intense users. Now everyone has access to this. You all have access to this. And over time, we've seen all of our users grow in volume and sophistication, which takes me to the ML engineers. We're equally passionate about serving these users, and they have a different set of needs, and there are a lot more of them. One of the funnest things about being in this industry right now running this company right now, is that I see every industry, from fintech to healthcare to gaming to retail, in our customer base. We have the five largest automotive companies as our customers, six of the 12 largest pharma companies, 10 of the 15 largest technology companies, and we love seeing these companies make AI work in the real world, and we love supporting the people that make that happen. And there's one request, also a little bit in the weeds, that we've had from our ML engineers for years, especially the customers with the biggest teams, and that is the ability to save multiple views. Really specific request, but I'm so excited that we have this for you now. As ML projects grow in complexity, people want to view their data in different ways, and especially share multiple live workspaces with their colleagues. Now you can save multiple views, share those with your team. We've also built out a model registry that we feel is best in class, that not only shows you models go in and out of production, but lets you see the full lineage of how those models were created at all times. We also have a system called automations where you can kick off a run, ends in the middle of the night, and that causes thousands of evaluations to run in a distributed way in the background, and then you wake up in the morning, you can see how your run did on many, many different data points. I could go on and on about new functionality, but besides this new functionality, there's one more major shift in the way ML engineers especially train their models, and that is fine tuning. This is here a graph of the fraction of the people using Hugging Face Trainer, which is a popular ML library primarily used for fine tuning on our platform. 
2022, we see nobody using it. 2023, we see half a percent of our runs using it. 2024, we see 11% of our runs using this. And this is probably a serious underestimate of the people on our platform doing fine tuning. So this shows a massive change in the availability of fine tuning and the importance of it. And we wanted to support this new mode. How are we going to support it? We did the first obvious thing, which is we integrated really well with Hugging Face Trainer. So when you use Hugging Face Trainer, you get a lot of value right out of the box. And I'll say we love integrating with popular tools like this, but we love even more when the popular tools decide to integrate with us. So I wanted to talk about some of the integrations that actually came out in the last two weeks that we really value because these are our partners doing the integration with weights and biases on behalf of our joint users. The first one is our integration with OpenAI Fine Tuning, which came out last week. They launched this, and now you can pass your WMB credentials into OpenAI one time, and forever after that, your OpenAI Fine Tuning runs will log into your Weights and Biases account. Brand new from OpenAI. And yesterday, PyTorch launched TorchTune with the first class integration with Weights and Biases. So same thing. Um, you set this up, and all your data flows into weights and biases. I just want to say one more time, there's so many features I can't mention here. Please come by our demo booth and check it out. <laughs> but I also want to carve out more time to talk about where we're going. And when I think about where we're going, there's one thing that stands out so much more above the rest. It's the only thing I'm going to talk about when I talk about where we're going. We've long served foundation model builders and ML engineers. But there is a new kind of user building AI applications that we're determined to serve well. And that is software engineers. These are software developers operating in an AI developer workflow, building gen AI applications. And we are so excited to serve this new audience. Now, any software developer today can make an impressive demo using Gen AI APIs. Many of you in the audience are doing that. But what we've seen, and there's a whole bunch of examples in the news right now, I won't name names, but in order to take those demos and turn them into real world applications that really work, these software developers are going to need to learn how to operate in the AI developer workflow, which means they're going to need to learn how to track evaluations. They're going to, learn, they're going to need to learn to iterate on non-deterministic underlying platforms. And we are here to help. And we're especially excited to help because this is such a massive group of people. The scale that software developers bring to AI applications is like nothing we've seen before. We think the best thing that we could be working on for the world is to empower these developers with a new set of tools. And we're calling these tools Weave. And to show you these tools, here's my co-founder and CTO, Sean. 